Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome to Canadian History X. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. As well, if you're a fan of Canadian history, make sure you check out all of my shows, from John to Justin, Canadian History X, Canada, A Yearly Journey, and Pucks and Cups, along with Canada's Great War. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. Just click Donate. It helps keep this show going. And all donations in September will be going to the SPCA in the memory of my best pal Boris, who sadly passed away earlier this month. Before we start, I want to say thank you to, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Benoit Goagati, who was nice enough to leave me a donation. Okay, on with the show. Edgar Millen had taken a long journey to get to this point. Born in Ireland in 1901, he came to Canada with his family in 1907 to begin a new life in a wide open land. And while the family settled in their new home, their belongings stayed in Ireland. These items would be sent to Canada in April 1912 on a new ship called the Titanic. Unfortunately, history had other ideas, and the family never received their belongings. As Edgar grew up, he developed a love of baking, and his fruit pie was a special treat the family and their friends loved to sample. At the age of 20, on November 22, 1920, Edgar enlisted with the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, hoping to serve his adopted home. Called Newt by his fellow officers, it was always Edgar when he was home, and he trained in Regina. After graduation, Edgar served in posts across the Canadian West, from Winnipeg to Jasper, from Kalavik to Cambridge Bay. He returned to Edmonton in 1930 to serve with the city police force, but his love was for the RCMP, and he returned to its ranks. Eventually, he wound up at Fort McPherson, where he was well-liked for his humor, common sense, and skill in bushcraft. That journey, beginning when he took a ship across the Atlantic Ocean with his family 25 years earlier, led Edgar to this moment in time, January 30th, 1932, on the frozen landscape of the Northwest Territories. It was a moment that would bring his life to a tragic end and cement in Canadian lore the legend of the Mad Trapper. I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X. Fort McPherson is about as far north as you can go in the continental Northwest Territories. Only 140 kilometers from the shores of the Arctic Ocean, what had started as a trading post in 1840, had become an important outpost for fur traders, missionaries, and police officers. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police had established a post in the community where they would help assert the sovereignty of Canada in the Arctic. In 1911, four officers set out from the community for Dawson, 760 kilometers away. They would never arrive and become known as the Lost Patrol. That brings us to the winter of 1931, when indigenous trappers around Fort McPherson began to notice that someone had been tripping their traps, and even hanging them from trees. In some cases, their traps were replaced by the perpetrator's traps. With it clear that a human was the culprit, the local RCMP detachment began to investigate, and that would lead them to a man who had recently come to the area, Albert Johnson. Little is known about Albert Johnson prior to entering the history books in 1932. It is not even known if Albert Johnson was his real name, and I think we can assume that it wasn't. Johnson had arrived in Fort McPherson after coming down the Peel River on July 9, 1931. Described at the time as a clean-shaven Scandinavian who flashed plenty of money around, upon arriving in the community he was questioned by Edgar Millen, and neither man knew that their fates would be linked. He was described as medium-sized, 35 to 40 years old, stoop-shouldered, with sun-reddened and fly-bitten skin. Over the next 10 days at the fort, Johnson spent $1,400, a sizable amount for the time. Johnson then left and built a shack on the Rat River, 
having failed to get up the Rat Rapids, and he's wintering at the Rat Canyon. He'd also begun to trap without a license, and when the indigenous people confronted him, he chased them off with a rifle. After receiving the complaints from the indigenous people of the region, the RCMP wanted to speak with Johnson to see if he was the man tripping the traps. If he was, he would receive the customary fine. No one marching through the Arctic wilderness towards Johnson's cabin could have thought that they were beginning the story that would become a Canadian legend. On December 26th, Constable Alfred King and Special Constable Joe Bernard journeyed 97 kilometers to Johnson's cabin. Now, calling it a cabin would be an exaggeration. It stood in a clump of willow and spruce trees on the left bank of the river, buried in the snow. Only 8 feet by 10 feet, it was sunk 3 feet into the gravel bank. The roof was poles with frozen sod, and the logs that were made of the walls were laden with holes. As their long journey came to an end, they saw smoke rising from the cabin of Johnson, but when they knocked on the door, he didn't answer. When King looked in the cabin window, Johnson put a sack across it. Rather than press further, the constables decided to return to their post and obtain a search warrant. Five days later, the constables returned with five other officers to deliver the search warrant. Once again, Johnson refused to open the door, and Constable King decided that with the warrant, he would force the door open himself. Shots soon rang out as Johnson fired on the officers, wounding King. The other officers grabbed King and pulled him away from the cabin, and made the long journey back to civilization, where King recovered, but only by pure luck. He'd been shot in the stomach, and the bullet had missed his heart and lungs by a mere inch. At this point, Johnson became the most wanted man in the Northwest Territories. The officers who had traveled to the cabin were shocked that Johnson would fire on an RCMP officer, over something as minor as a trapping violation. Due to this, they believed Johnson to be a very dangerous individual. It was also at this time that the hunt of the Mad Trapper would first begin to appear in newspapers. The Edmonton Journal wrote on January 4, 1931, Shot through the chest, allegedly by a man he was attempting to arrest, Constable A.W. King of the Arctic Red River Detachment of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is lying in critical condition. McDowell and King were investigating complaints of Indians that their trap lines had been tampered with when they visited a lone trapper's cabin. The owner, the Indian said, had been acting queerly and appeared to have become unbalanced mentally as a result of his lonely life. Johnson would survive, but he would spend several weeks in the hospital at Aklavik. A posse of individuals led by RCMP inspector Alexander Eames left at the beginning of January 1932 to arrest Johnson. Joining Eames were several constables, including Constable Millen, a few locals, and one indigenous guide named Charlie Rat. On January 9th, the police posse reached the cabin, which had been fortified by Johnson. When Eames demanded Johnson surrender, Johnson responded by firing shots at the group. The party attempted to storm the cabin, but Johnson drove them back by firing a shotgun and rifle. This time, though, the party was going to do everything it could to remove Johnson from his cabin. This included using dynamite. The party threw dynamite at the cabin, which eventually blew off the cabin's roof and partially collapsed its walls. Despite this, Johnson continued to fire at the officers. After 24 hours attempting to remove Johnson, the party decided that with the temperatures at minus 43 degrees Celsius and food for themselves and their dogs running low, they would go back. Many of the men were already showing signs of frostbite on their skin. Constable Millen and Carl Cardland returned to the cabin on January 14th, but found that Johnson had fled and his tracks were obscured by a recent snowfall. As they searched what remained of his cabin, they found a series of bunkers, each the size of a man's body, hacked from the gravel and lined with spruce boughs. Fires had been built in them against the wall to reflect the heat, and within the cabin there were no furs and no papers. And by this point, the rest of Canada was beginning to learn about the mad trapper of Rat River. One can associate the residential school system with tuberculosis and tuberculosis with the residential school system. We had indigenous parents, communities, students, church employees, teachers, and individuals who are part of Indian Affairs like Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce giving their critiques in their own time. 
people hid when the tuberculosis screening came to their communities because they knew that the result of getting screened was that they, they could be taken away. I believe a lot of people were used, government officials who just thought they were doing the right thing. They were doing what they were told. First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples have already told our story. It's now time to tell the other side of the story. We need to take a serious look at the parts of the system from the past that we may be replicating today. I'm Maya Foster Sanchez, and this is the story of a national crime. Coming this fall, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Great Depression was a difficult time for Canada. By 1932, nearly 30% of the labor force was out of work, and 20% of the Canadian population was accepting government assistance. Between 1929 and 1933, the gross national expenditure fell by 42%. Wages were falling, and Prime Minister R.B. Bennett, himself a millionaire, was highly unpopular. As people tore out the engines of their automobiles and turned them into wagons pulled by horses, they would give these vehicles the name of Bennett Buggies. Provinces such as Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba were especially hard hit by drought and low prices for crops. Monthly relief rates varied wildly throughout Canada. In Calgary, a family of five received $60, or $1,200 today per month, while in Halifax, the same family would receive $15. For single men without a home, such as Johnson, there was no relief until 1932, and those were just construction camps where they were paid 20 cents a day to work in relatively harsh conditions. From this environment, labor unions and protests would begin to rise in popularity and strength. People wanted people to stand up to the government they felt was ignoring their concerns. When they wanted help, they received radio addresses telling them that Canada would get through the dark days, such as this one from Bennett. But our country faced the problem. The great dark days of depression were upon us. Our revenues had fallen and were falling. Unemployment was right. Our agrarians no longer found it possible by the development of their wheat fields to find new wealth for there were no purchasers of their commodities. The industrial fabric shivered and shook, as your president has said, because the output of the factories could no longer be purchased by those who had formerly been their customers. And so our world, our little world, in a very short few hours, a few days and months, became indeed greatly depressed. A depression that we soon learned was universal. Not confined to one community or two, but extending to the most remote parts of the world, visiting alike the older civilizations and the younger, and challenging the confidence and faith and adaptability and resourcefulness of the people to the country as nothing has done before. And I quite agree with what the chairman has said when he indicated that all have suffered. The agrarian has suffered, the manufacturer has suffered, the farmer has suffered, the man who toiled by the day has suffered, the street cleaner has suffered. In every branch of human activity, in every avenue of effort, men and women have suffered. It was in this situation that Johnson began to emerge as a folk hero for a time for Canadians. Many Canadians sympathized with Johnson and his desire to be left alone, amid what they saw as the interference from the federal government. At the time, due to the crackdowns on protests by the government using the RCMP, the force was especially unpopular. Many felt that the government had been ignoring them, and their requests for help had gone unanswered. And throughout Canada, people waited to get the latest information about the man who was on the run from the government. For days, the police looked for Johnson, they found a cache of caribou meat that he had left behind, and they watched it for days, waiting for him to return, but he never did. Sometimes they would pick up on his trail, but they soon lost it. On January 30th, the RCMP party finally found Johnson and surrounded him in a thicket. A firefight soon erupted and Johnson shot Constable Millen through the heart, killing him instantly. With one man dead, the RCMP retreated back to civilization, and Johnson continued to hide out in the wilderness. As soon as news began to spread of the death of Millen, people from across the Delta came to the area and the RCMP had their pick of individuals who wanted to help and avenge the death of a man they liked. The RCMP would enlist the help of the local indigenous people, who would move easier through the backcountry and track Johnson with ease. 
Believing that Johnson was planning on leaving for the Yukon, the only two passes in the Richardson Mountains were blocked. If there is one thing that can be said of Johnson, it is that he was determined. Instead of taking a path through the passes, he climbed a 7,000-foot peak and again disappeared into the wilderness. Johnson was actually proving himself to be highly resourceful and very difficult to find. Along with his incredible stanima, he would backtrack and leave blind trails to confuse his trackers. He would often follow caribou trails so his own tracks were lost in the tracks of the animals. And along with climbing mountains, he went through underbrush that was incredibly difficult to move through, and he fed himself on small game and lit small fires to keep warm under the cover of snowbanks. One trapper said, It is rough enough just staying alive under those conditions, let alone having to do it on the run. To aid in their search against the crafty and clever Johnson, the RCMP decided that it was time to bring in something new, air support from a First World War legend. Well before the hunt for the Mad Trapper, Wilfred Reed Wap May was a legend. He had served in the First World War and was part of the dogfight that brought down the Red Baron. A recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross, May shot down 15 confirmed aircraft and likely five others. After the war, he set up the first airport in Canada in Edmonton, took part in the first aerial manhunt in 1919, and was the man who flew the diphtheria inoculations 500 kilometers through the freezing cold in an open cockpit plane to Fort Vermilion to save the lives of the people in the community who were in danger of getting the disease. By this point, May was an aviation legend, and now it was time for another chapter in the story of Wap May when the RCMP hired him to hunt for Johnson from the air. He brought with him several tear gas bombs, which would be used to force Johnson out of hiding. On February 5th, May arrived in his monoplane, and he soon discovered that Johnson had made it over the Richardson Mountains when he saw tracks from the air. This was no simple task for May, despite his skill as a pilot. The winds were bad, and snow swirled thousands of feet in the air. Soon after, word came from the RCMP detachment at Old Crow in the Yukon, near the Alaska border, where indigenous hunters had seen strange tracks while they were pursuing a moose. The tracks were fresh and heading down the Bell River, towards Alaska. On February 14th, May saw footprints leading off the center of the frozen surface of the Eagle River to the bank, where Johnson had been using the tracks of the caribou. Over the course of the next three days, May radioed his findings to the RCMP, who began to chase Johnson up the river, eventually reaching him on February 17th, where the last standoff would occur. By this point, the RCMP party had 11 people in it. As the RCMP rounded a bend in the river, they suddenly saw Johnson standing only a few hundred meters in front of them. They gave chase and Johnson tried to run up a snowbank, but his lack of snowshoes slowed his progress and the firefight soon broke out. Constable Earl Hershey was seriously injured in the firefight, while Johnson was killed when a bullet entered his left side of the pelvis at an acute angle. The bullet would pass through the bowels and main arteries, leading to his death. May soon landed on the frozen river and collected Constable Hershey, who was transported to a doctor. Hershey had been shot through the left knee and into the elbow. Along the way, the bullet smashed two ribs and pierced his lungs. Without May, it's likely Hershey would have died. In fact, the doctor said if he had taken 15 minutes longer, Hershey would have certainly been dead. The entire manhunt from Johnson's cabin to the spot where he died had run for 33 days, covering 137 kilometers, during which time the RCMP pursuers burned 10,000 calories a day in the cold weather. When they examined Johnson's body, they found that he had $2,000 on him, amounting to $42,000 today. He also had gold, a compass, razor, knife, fish hooks, a dead squirrel and bird, several laxative pills, and teeth with gold fillings. The teeth were perplexing to the RCMP, as Johnson had perfect teeth and had no reason to be carrying false teeth. The Montreal Gazette would write, The body of the slain outlaw was a mere bag of bones. Not one of the men from the Yukon or the Northwest Territories who viewed the body could say that they had seen the man before. Throughout the entire pursuit and firefight, Johnson had never uttered a single word. The only sound the RCMP said they had heard from him was a laugh when he shot Constable Millen. So what happened to the men behind the manhunt? Constable Alfred King would return home to Ottawa from the hospital on March 15th and live a full life 
passing away in 1978. Earl Hershey would survive his injury and, quite honestly, live a life most of us could only wish for. He would serve with the Canadian Army as a signalman, eventually reaching the rank of major by the end of the Second World War. While in Ireland, he won the Irish sweepstakes, which netted him $157,000, amounting to $2.6 million today. During his time in Italy, he also apparently met the Pope. In 1946, he took part in the exercise muskox, a trial run to determine if snowmobiles could replace dog sleds. He would travel 2,900 kilometers down to Edmonton as part of the run. After he retired in 1955 at the age of 50, he served on the Barrie City Council for 16 years and would pass away at the ripe old age of 100 in 2006. As for Wap May, he would become a trainer of Royal Air Force pilots from the British Commonwealth during the Second World War and was a commander of the No. 2 Observer School in Edmonton. He also served as a supervisor of the Western Training Schools of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. He would then establish a smoke jumper school in Montana and use that experience to create a search and rescue unit in the Canadian Army. For his work with search and rescue, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom with a bronze palm from the United States Army Air Force, and he would pass away on June 21, 1952, while hiking in Utah. As for Constable Millen, a memorial was built at Fort McPherson, which was just recently restored. And that's the story of the Mad Trapper. But stay tuned for the end of the episode, when I look at who this man could have been. The more fame Johnson received for the manhunt, the more people claimed they knew him. Women would claim that he was their husband, father, brother, or son. Some said he was the Blueberry Kid, a killer out of Michigan. Others said he was an ex-RCMP officer, or a First World War I sniper. All of the claims were investigated by the RCMP. The fingerprints of Johnson were sent across North America and into Europe. His photograph was printed in newspapers on three continents. Even an attempt to trace his weapons and banknotes led nowhere. But who could have he been? Well, Arthur Nelson, a prospector from British Columbia who left the province in 1931, was one person speculated to be Arthur Johnson, as was Johnny Johnson an American outlaw who journeyed into the Arctic in the 1920s. There was Owen Albert Johnson and Sigvald Peterson Hestjold, both of whom left British Columbia in the late 1920s and were believed to have moved into the Arctic. Descendants of these individuals would provide DNA, none of which matched that of Albert Johnson. Then there was Edgar Merring, who lived in Berwyn, Alberta, and always talked of moving to the Arctic. One day he left his homestead and he was never heard from again. Years later, when the Mad Trapper's photo appeared in newspapers, many residents of Berwyn said it looked just like him. So who was he? It's likely we will never know. But his story lives on in many films. Johnson, we've got a bad situation out here. I have a bunch of savages out here just aching to splatter you all over the place. They don't want your side at all. Now if you don't come in with me, that's all the excuse they'll need. They'll either kill you or get themselves killed trying. You can't stop it. Hold it! They fight for the same cause. They live by the same code. But now, the law has made them enemies. Death Hunt. Based on the true story of one of the greatest manhunts ever. If anybody's going to bring Albert Johnson in, it's going to be me. Not some bounty hunter or a fly boy bucking for promotion. Why you? Why are you so special? He deserves me. Lee Marvin has the badge and the determination to get his man. Would it make any difference if I waited? If I left now, I'd never know what it would have been like with you. Let's go! He's the last man in the world that anybody would want on his trail. Charles Brunson has the wilderness. We've been hunting a man that knows how to live off the land and use the terrain. As you can see, he was one of the American best trained men. Special intelligence squad in the war. And the will to be free. Pure fact is he's running to save his eye. And every man he killed, he killed to protect himself. Well, what about Hawkins or Sundog? Or any of them. What did any of them die for, Millen? 
Johnson didn't do anything I wouldn't do if I was in his boots. If I thought the killing had stopped here, I'd let him go. Charles Brunson, Lee Marvin, Death Hunt. Two men of equal courage face each other as enemies and triumph as heroes along the last frontier. There he is! We got it! Death Hunt. What you just heard was a trailer from a 1981 film called Death Hunt, which starred Charles Bronson. The film plays fast and loose with the facts, turning Johnson into a sympathetic figure, while Constable Millen was portrayed as an old, broken-down alcoholic. Wap May became someone who did reconnaissance from the air in the manhunt to a reckless pilot who was shot down and killed by the posse after he shoots at them. But this wasn't the only film to portray the story, nor was it the only one to change the facts. The Mad Trapper, a film from 1971, portrayed Johnson as an American trying to live in peace, and is the other trappers who work with the RCMP to get rid of him. Challenge to be Free, a film from 1975, also portrayed Johnson to be a sympathetic figure, similar to a Johnny Appleseed, who lived in harmony with wild animals. And other than the documentaries, it is unlikely we will ever see a true and accurate portrayal of the hunt for the Mad Trapper on the screen. Thank you for joining me on Canadian History X. Information from McLean's Canadian Encyclopedia, RCMP Honor Roll Number 51, Edmonton Journal, Montreal Star, Wikipedia, Montreal Gazette, Windsor Star, Vancouver Sun, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon Radio System. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of producer Dila Velasquez. Audio design and production by Rob Johnson. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help others find these amazing stories, and there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. And we love hearing from you. So if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com. And don't forget to stop by my website and social media. I've included all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.